The Truth About Angels, Chapter 6 Angels Before and After Noah's Flood The Plan of Salvation Explained Further Angels held communication with Adam after his fall and informed him of the plan of salvation and that the human race was not beyond redemption. Angels informed Adam that, as his transgression had brought death and wretchedness, life and immortality would be brought to light through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from its pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence, their entrance barred only by the watching angels. Worship at the Cherubim Guarded Gate At the Cherubim Guarded Gate of Paradise, the glory of the Lord was revealed, and hither came the first worshippers. It was here that Cain and Abel had brought their sacrifices, and God had condescended to communicate with them. Skepticism could not deny the existence of Eden, while it stood just in sight, its entrance barred by watching angels. The order of creation, the object of the garden, the history of its two trees so closely connected with man's destiny, were undisputed facts. And the existence and supreme authority of God, the obligation to His law, were truths which men were slow to question while Adam was among them. Cain and Abel had been instructed in regard to the provision made for the salvation of the human race. They were required to carry out a system of humble obedience, showing their reverence for God and their faith and dependence upon the promised Redeemer by slaying the firstlings of the flock and solemnly presenting it with the blood as a burnt offering to God. He, Cain, was unwilling to strictly follow the plan of obedience and procure a lamb and offer it with the fruit of the ground. He merely took of the fruit of the ground and disregarded the requirement of God. Abel advised his brother not to come before the Lord without the blood of a sacrifice. Cain, being the eldest, would not listen to his brother. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat, as God had commanded. And in full faith of the Messiah to come, and with humble reverence, he presented the offering. God had respect unto his offering. A light flashes from heaven and consumes the offering of Abel. Cain sees no manifestation that his is accepted. He is angry with the Lord and with his brother. God condescends to send an angel to Cain to converse with him. The angel inquires of him the reason of his anger and informs him that if he does well and follows the directions God has given, he will accept him and respect his offering. But if he will not humbly submit to God's arrangements and believe and obey him, he cannot accept his offering. The angel tells Cain that it was no injustice on the part of God or partiality shown to Abel, but that it was on account of his own sin and disobedience of God's express command why he could not respect his offering, and if he would do well, he would be accepted of God. But even after being thus faithfully instructed, Cain did not repent. In his jealousy and hatred, he contends with Abel and reproaches him. While Abel justifies the plan of God, Cain becomes enraged, and his anger increases and burns against Abel, until in his rage he slays him. Adam and Angels Instructed Antediluvians The advantages enjoyed by men of that age, pre-flood, to gain a knowledge of God through his works, have never been equaled since. And so far from being an era of religious darkness, that was an age of great light. All the world had opportunity to receive instruction from Adam, and those who feared the Lord had also Christ and angels for their teachers. Men lived nearly a thousand years in those days, before the flood, and angels visited them with instruction directly from Christ. 
Enoch. Enoch learned from the lips of Adam the painful story of the fall and the precious story of God's condescending grace in the gift of his son as the world's redeemer. He believed and relied upon the promise given. Enoch was a holy man. He served God with singleness of heart. He realized the corruptions of the human family and separated himself from the descendants of Cain and reproved them for their great wickedness. His soul was vexed as he daily beheld them trampling upon the authority of God. He chose to be separate from them and spent much of his time in solitude, giving himself to reflection and prayer. He waited before God and prayed to know his will more perfectly, that he might perform it. God communed with Enoch through his angels and gave him divine instruction. He made known to him that he would not always bear with man in his rebellion, that it was his purpose to destroy the sinful race by bringing a flood of waters upon the earth. The Lord opened more fully to Enoch the plan of salvation, and by the spirit of prophecy carried him down through the generations which should live after the flood, and showed him the great events connected with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. Enoch was troubled in regard to the dead. It seemed to him that the righteous and the wicked would go to the dust together, and that would be their end. He could not see the life of the just beyond the grave. In prophetic vision, he was instructed in regard to the Son of God, who was to die man's sacrifice, and was shown the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven, attended by the angelic host, to give life to the righteous dead and ransom them from their graves. Enoch faithfully rehearsed to the people all that had been revealed to him by the spirit of prophecy. Some believed his words and turned from their wickedness to fear and worship God. He, Enoch, chose certain periods for retirement and would not suffer the people to find him, for they interrupted his holy meditation and communion with God. He did not exclude himself at all times from the society of those who loved him and listened to his words of wisdom. Neither did he separate himself wholly from the corrupt. He met with the good and bad at stated times and labored to turn the ungodly from their evil course. Enoch continued to grow more heavenly while communing with God. The Lord loved Enoch because he steadfastly followed him and abhorred iniquity, and earnestly sought a more perfect knowledge of his will, that he might perform it. He yearned to unite himself still more closely to God, whom he feared, reverenced, and adored. The Lord would not permit Enoch to die like other men, but sent his angels to take him to heaven without seeing death. In the presence of the righteous and the wicked, Enoch was removed from them, those who loved him thought that God might have left him in some of his places of retirement. But after seeking diligently and being unable to find him, they reported that he was not, for God took him. The flaming chariots of God were sent for this holy man, and he was born to heaven. The Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Wings were given me, and an angel attended me from the city to a place that was bright and glorious. Then I was taken to a world which had seven moons. There I saw good old Enoch, who had been translated. On his right arm he bore a glorious palm, and on each leaf was written, Victory. Around his head was a dazzling white wreath, and leaves on the wreath, and in the middle of each leaf was written, Purity. And around the wreath were stones of various colors that shone brighter than the stars, and cast a reflection upon the letters, and magnified them. On the back part of his head was a bow that confined the wreath, and upon the bow was written, Holiness. Above the wreath was a lovely crown that shone brighter than the sun, I asked him if this was the place he was taken to from the earth. He said, It is not, 
The city is my home, and I have come to visit this place. Enoch represents those who shall remain upon the earth and be translated to heaven without seeing death. He represents that company that are to live amid the perils of the last days and withstand all the corruption, vileness, sin, and iniquity, and yet be unsullied by it all. We can stand as did Enoch. There has been provision made for us. Angels of God that excel in strength are sent to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. These angels, when they see that we are doing the very utmost on our part to be overcomers, will do their part, and their light will shine around about us, and sway back the influence of the evil angels that are around us, and will make a fortification around us as a wall of fire. Noah those who lived in the days of Noah and Abraham were more like the angels in form, in comeliness and strength. But every generation has been growing weaker. More than one hundred years before the flood, the Lord sent an angel to faithful Noah to make known to him that he would no longer have mercy upon the corrupt race. But he would not have them ignorant of his design. He would instruct Noah and make him a faithful preacher to warn the world of its coming destruction, that the inhabitants of the earth might be left without excuse. Angels were sent to collect from the forest and field the beasts which God had created. Angels went before these animals, and they followed two and two, male and female, and clean beasts by sevens. Everything was now ready for the closing of the ark, which could not have been done by Noah from within. An angel is seen by the scoffing multitude descending from heaven, clothed with brightness like the lightning. He closes that massive outer door and then takes his course upward to heaven again. The flood comes. Notwithstanding the solemn exhibition, they, the antediluvians, had witnessed of God's power, of the unnatural occurrence of the beasts leaving the forests and fields and going into the ark, and the angel of God clothed with brightness and terrible in majesty, descending from heaven and closing the door. Yet they hardened their hearts and continued to revel and sport over the signal manifestations of divine power. But upon the eighth day, the heavens gathered blackness. The rain descended from the clouds above them. This was something they had never witnessed. The storm increased in violence until water seemed to come from heaven like mighty cataracts. Jets of water would burst up from the earth with indescribable force, throwing massive rocks hundreds of feet into the air and then they would bury themselves deep in the earth. The violence of the storm increased, and there were mingled with the warring of the elements the wailings of the people who had despised the authority of God. Trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description, and even Satan himself who was compelled to be amid the warring elements, feared for his own existence. Angels that excel in strength guided the ark and preserved it from harm. Every moment during that frightful storm of forty days and forty nights, the preservation of the ark was a miracle of almighty power. After the Flood Anxiously did Noah and his family watch the decrease of the waters he desired to go forth upon the earth again. He sent out a raven, which flew back and forth to and from the ark. He did not receive the information he desired, and he sent forth a dove, which, finding no rest, returned to the ark again. After seven days, the dove was sent forth again, and when the olive leaf was seen in its mouth, there was great rejoicing by this family of eight, which had so long been shut up in the ark. 
Again an angel descends and opens the door of the ark. Noah could remove the top, but he could not open the door which God had shut. God spoke to Noah through the angel who opened the door, and bade the family of Noah go forth out of the ark, and bring forth with them every living thing. After Noah had come forth from the ark, he looked around upon the powerful and ferocious beasts which he brought out of the ark, and then upon his family numbering eight and was greatly afraid that they would be destroyed by the beasts. But the Lord sent his angel to say to Noah, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hands are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. The Builders of Babel Some of the descendants of Noah soon began to apostatize. Some disbelieved in the existence of God. Others believed that God existed. Those who were enemies of God felt daily reproved by the righteous conversation and godly lives of those who loved, obeyed, and exalted God. The unbelieving consulted among themselves and agreed to separate from the faithful. They journeyed a distance from them and selected a large plain wherein to dwell. They built them a city and then conceived the idea of building a large tower to reach unto the clouds that they might be no more scattered. They would build their tower to a much greater height than the waters prevailed in the time of the flood. And they would be as gods and rule over the people. They exalted themselves against God, but he would not permit them to complete their work. They had built their tower to a lofty height when the Lord sent two angels to confound them in their work. The angels confounded their language. After this, there was no harmony in their work. Angry with one another and unable to account for the misunderstanding and strange words among them, they left the work and separated from each other and scattered abroad in the earth. Up to this time, men had spoken but one language. Lightning from heaven, as a token of God's wrath, broke off the top of their tower, casting it to the ground.